Hey, this is Evan Longoria of your San Francisco Giants, and you're listening to TortureCast. You're listening to a podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. Let's go, Giants! With hosts Willie Dills, Chad King, Ben Lee, and Eric Nathanson. Dedicated to the greatest team in Major League Baseball, the San Francisco Giants. This is Torture Cast. So here's Sandoval. to right. Brian back, it's off the wall, and this game is over. In the 13th, two outs and nobody on. A walk, a single, and Buster Posey hits it over the head of Chris Bryant, and the Giants win the ball game. He never had a chance to get back on it. Everybody, welcome to the Torture Cast. It is Thursday, July 28th. 2018 and this is episode 147 uh boy you just heard some great highlights there from the three game series against the cubs of course the first game featured a walk-off hit in the 11th inning by pablo sandoval with the bases loaded and five infielders which we can talk about a little bit and then yesterday's game a wonderful conclusion despite leading four to nothing at one point the cubs chipped back chipped away tied it but they went to extra innings and the giants pulled it out in the bottom of the 13th with that Single off the wall by Buster Posey. But joining me today to talk about all this wonderful stuff uh, is Eric out in hot ass Georgia. What's up, Eric? <laughs> Not much. I'm sitting in a giant inflatable tube full of ice. I'm, I'm just going to, every five minutes, I'm just keep calling the wife to pr- come in and dump more ice over me. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> it is so bad out here. We, we have covered the windows. It is, it is brutal. I, 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 this is some heat I've never dealt with. So your air conditioning just cannot keep up with this, huh? It, it, can't, it can't. Last night, it was past midnight, and it was still 77 degrees in the house. Yeah. Ooh, hmm, fun. What is it in the house right now? Now it's about 78. 78, and you're sitting in the ice? <laughs> yeah. So, so my body temp's down to about, you know, probably 96.8, so I'm probably down to about 94 by now. All right. All right. Trying. Just don't get hypothermic on us. Oh, there's another bucket. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, hey, Giants are doing pretty well. They, they took two out of three from the Cubs. I mean, yeah, they're four and six since we last recorded. They had a bit of a, a stumble in Colorado, which we don't really have to talk too much about that series because it was just, I want to blow up Cor- Coors Field. It was, a, it was just a crappy bullshit series. It was games three that runs. Sh- shouldn't have lost, but they did because, yeah, three runs in three games in Coors Field. Unbelievable. But... We can get past that. That set a record, by the way. I think their previous low was seven in a three-game yep. series in Coors Field, which it's hard to do. You and I might actually be able to get a couple base hits there just by putting the bat out. But um, nonetheless, they split against St. Louis, and they took two out of three from Chicago. And, you know, a lot of times we're saying, oh, they could have, they should have, they would have. But to be honest, I mean, they could have been swept by the Cubs. I mean, you consider they lost one game, and the other two were extra innings, and they their bullpen – Held it down, uh, held him scoreless for so many innings, up and in, up two extra innings and and during extra innings. So I think you got to tip your cap to the bullpen, despite the offensive struggles and the lack of timely hitting until the end. Uh, but the Giants pulled two out of three from a very very good Cubs team. And so how are you feeling about things right now, Eric? Oh, they they looked like a real ball club these last few days. There's something about rising to the level of competition that seems this team seems to do. And this three-game series, you, you point out the Cubs could have swept. The Giants very well could have swept the three games themselves. The, yeah. They got shut out in game two of the series, and Holland pitched an absolute gem, his best performance as a Giant thus far. So, I mean, they're looking like a team where one break goes their way or another break goes their way, and they jump right on the opportunities. Uh, he, Derek Holland pulled one hell of a, a start out, and you know, it was one of those rough luck losses. It, it stunk, you know, because – Ironically, game one of the series featured a, um, <laughs> a crazy play in which Alan Hansen was 
was on first, and the pickoff attempt was made. And to be honest, Rizzo just missed the ball. It, it was all on Rizzo. He just missed the ball. And it ricocheted down the right field line, and Hansen kind of was running about, you know, 90% to second, maybe about 80% to third. And then Wotus just started sending them. And I was there at the game with my kids, and I'm standing up going, send them, send them, send them, because I could tell. It just seemed like Baez who, or whoever picked up the ball, there, there just was no hurry. You know what I mean? It was just like, all right, he's going to second or third or whatever. I'll just get the ball and throw it in. And they took advantage of it with Hanson's speed. And even though it wasn't 100% speed around the bases, when he hit 30, did kick it into that fifth gear and just beat the throw with a beautiful slide at home. But that totally invigorated the crowd, tied the game, which enabled them to go to extra innings and win the game. But unfortunately, on on the next game, yeah, Holland kind of featured a uh, a bad luck loss too, uh, in a very similar way in uh, some some errors committed on the field uh, by who was it? It was uh, Nick Hundley, of course, uh, at home. And, oh yeah, you know, he threw one in the left field. That's threw right. one in the left field. You know, it, it, it happens. It was attempted steal, and he threw it in the left field, and that scored a run. So that was kind of the difference in the game for Holland. He got the the tough luck loss there, but. That's baseball for you, you know. They got one on, on the first game, and they gave one back on the second game. So it is what it is. Alan Hansen's Mad Dash was the play of the year so far. I, I could watch that. I could watch that over and over and over again. You know, the old adage is you can go to a baseball game and see something you've never seen before. And like you said, you were at that baseball game, and I guarantee you've never seen that before. I've never and, seen and, that, certainly not live, and I can't recall the last time I saw it on TV, maybe a highlight on SportsCenter, but as far as actually being there, because it was incredible to see that, you know, the pickoff throw, and everybody kind of sit, was still sitting, and, you know, he was running to second. And when he started rounding second, that's when people started standing up going, oh, look, he's going to go to third. This is great. Oh, my God, he's going home. <laughs> it almost it looked awesome. like he- yeah, it almost looks like he kind of baited Baez into coasting to the ball there at the end yeah, by slowing down a little bit, coming around third, and Baez <laughs> did. He totally – Rizzo Rizzo had such a horrible day that day. Uh, he had two errors. He had the error to get Hanson on base in the first yes. place and then the error on that play. And then Baez kind of coasted to the ball, like you said, assuming Hanson was just going to, you know – he hates to keep using the word coast, but he's just going to coast into third, and that would be it. And Hansen totally recognized it and saw that. And, I mean, Baez uncorked a really nice throw because Hansen beat it by the sp- split second. And that slide was absolutely amazing. He seems to know how to contort his body, much like Mr. Javi Baez on the other side. Mm-hmm. He knows how to contort his body when he's sliding into home to avoid the tag. We've seen Hansen do that slide across the plate about three or four times now where he sticks out the hand. And I know back in my playing days, that was one of my favorite slides. I I used to love doing that because if the play is going to be away from me, I'm going to bring as much of my body away from the play as I can and just touch the plate. And it was just, to me, it was the play of the year. And if the Giants go on to do some things this year, it epitomizes what this whole team is about, taking advantage of these opportunities. I mean, that's the full give you an inch, take a mile type thing. And it did. Like you said, I could feel the crowd through the – through the TV, I, I hopped out of uh, out of the out of my seat on the couch when it was happening. You know, he, he rounds third. I'm like, go to third, and I'm like, oh, go. And Kipes call. I know we didn't have it. Kipes like, and he's not gonna go. Oh, he is gonna go. It was it was just one of those. Everybody was caught by surprise type plays, <laughs> and, and they'll be talking about it for a while. They really will. All the MLB accounts blew up with it. I mean, because like we said, something I'd never seen before. Now that that is such a rarity. In fact, I, I should look up. Kipe's call because I heard Miller's call, which was okay. It wasn't that great, but um, it was fun to be there. My kids, of course, you know, they were standing up. They couldn't see past all the adults. They're like, "What's happening?" And I was like, "Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> they missed a really <laughs> awesome play." But just uh, baseball yeah. history, no big deal. Yes, you know. <laughs> but again, that was that was just just a critical play of the game. Otherwise, they lose one nothing. That's it. So yep. you know, they go to extra innings, and Panda is able to do it. Uh, they load the bases, of course, and Joe Madden. Pulls out the trickery again and brings in the outfielder to be the fifth infielder, switches gloves, the whole thing. And, and it's funny because the Giants broadcasters, Kruk and Kipe, they just hate that stuff. They call it high school, you know, tricks or whatever. High school, you know, menagerie or whatever. They just they just don't like it. They're like, just play the damn game. So, I mean, I, I myself admit that's not really that bad of a move because you hit it in the outfield with less than two outs, it's, it's probably going to be a run anyway. So it right. doesn't really matter if there's two or three outfielders, unless it's, of course, 
a line drive that would have been hit right at the previously occupied outfield spot. Okay, yeah, you could say that. But for the most part, you're you're trying to prevent that run from third scoring. And, and with less than two outs, it's actually not that bad of a, an idea to plug up the infield with another body, and then you can either get the double play or the play at home plate. So uh, well, I don't blame Well, the Cubs had it happen to them uh, over the weekend against the Reds. The oh, Reds used that. the five-man – yeah, they used the five-man infield, and it worked. There was a ground ball shot right at somebody. They got the out at home, and the Cubs ended up winning the next inning anyways. Oh. So like you, though, I don't mind it. It, it. it shores up the infield. And the nice thing about Pablo's base hit is, is it wasn't like he hit it to the open part of the outfield. It would have been a base hit with a normal configuration. Yeah, you know, no matter He what. hit it over the heads of the infielders with enough to get it over them but die before it gets to the outfielder. So at least he kind of made it a moot point. And Madden got flamed by it by the the Cubs fans for doing that. And it's kind of confusing because, like I said, it had worked just against them. But, you know, Cubs fans have become a fickle bunch. Why would they flame him for that when it had no out... It had no impact on the result. Like you said, if they had a normal arrangement, Pablo still gets the base hit. So why criticize him for that? Because it it didn't change anything. Because Cubs fans have turned into complete jerks since they won the title. (laughs) I will say this. You know, the, since the Giants have kind of, you know, come down off of their last World Series win almost four years ago now, uh, uh, the fervor and the energy around the park and the interest in tickets, of course, has certainly waned to a certain extent. Their sellout streak stopped sometime in 2017, which is still remarkable to think that that sellout streak continued over a period of whatever, five, six years, uh, which is amazing to fill up that ballpark every single day. They're still getting, you know, thirty five to thirty eight thousand per game out of forty thousand seats. It's, it's not a bad thing. They're still like third or fourth in attendance in, in major leagues. But I've noticed that getting tickets on StubHub, they are much cheaper than they used to be. They're well under face value. I got my tickets like 10 rows up from just behind the bullpen down the left field line for $25 a pop. So that wasn't bad. I mean, that was, those no, were pretty good prices for that. I mean, three years ago, those seats would have been $90, $100 each easily. And I think face values on those is uh, 75 or 80 or something like that. So they're well under face value. But the problem that, it, that, that arises from that is when popular teams come into town, those fans snatch up all the stub hub seats or the third mar- second market seats. And so I, the park was pretty much almost half Cubs. It really was. It, was. it was not just about as much blue and red as you saw of black and orange. And it was kind of upsetting just to see it. And I was surrounded by Cubs fans, unfortunately. But again, you get your, your bandwagon, and hey, I'm, I'm not, the, the Giants had plenty of bandwagon fans. I knew plenty of people sporting their black and orange gear, and they couldn't even name the starting, you know, three starting Giants. So I, I, it goes like this with all teams that get popular. The Red Sox had happened with an explosion in 2005 after they won their first World Series. The Yankees have always been like that. The Cubs have certainly been like that since they won their World Series, and <laughs> There's these, you know, four young people behind us. They all are decked out in, I mean, they're like, like 20s, you know, 25 years old or whatever. They're decked out in their Cubs gear, these two girls. And that God, you know, just talking like that. And you got the big old nails and the sunglasses and everything like that. They're spending all this money on jerseys and hats and whatever. And I think the, their boyfriends were a little bit embarrassed because they were like, I don't understand that play. Like, why did that guy do that? Why didn't he just do that? And who is that there? And like, they clearly knew nothing about the game. Like, let alone their own team. They didn't even know the rules of baseball. And you're just like, why are, what are you doing? Why? This is just a fashion show for you. You're just trying to do the hip thing. Jump on the bandwagon. Put on your, your pinstripe jersey that maybe your boyfriend bought for you. I don't know. And, and, and just come and eat your food and, and talk about something you have no idea what you're talking about. It's just, I hate it. As a baseball fan and purist, and I know you are too, Eric, it's just like nails on the chalkboard. It's like, it's like seeing that little kid who's a who's in the front row seat in the World Series game. And you're like, why the hell is a little kid at a World Series game? You know? It's just like, yeah. let the true baseball fans somehow get access to this stuff. You know? Why, why, are you, why is this moron who does nothing about the game sitting here decked out in Cubs gear? Why? Ugh! <laughs> anyway, a little bit of a tangent there, but it, it does bug me. It is fashionable to be a Cubs fan now, and even the hardcore Cubs fans I know will admit that the fan base and the bandwagon jumpers have gotten a little out of control. It's just it's funny though because like the Cubs are, seem like the most hated team. Giants fans hate the Cubs. Yeah, I mean I I couldn't believe it. Like nobody cares 
to at least appreciate certain things the Cubs do. No, it doesn't matter. Like, Javier Baez gets crapped on all the time by Giants fans, regardless of the fact that the guy is an absolute magician with his hands. Yeah, and he's he, a great player. I mean, he hit the homer off Tony Watson in the third game. Nobody has homered off Tony Watson. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's it's little stuff like that. And it's like, oh, well, he'll, he's still a piece of scum. No, the guy is phenomenal. You know, it was also nice to see, like, when Posey came to bat on Monday, and he and Wilson Contreras, you could tell, were briefly talking. And, and you got to wonder what that conversation was about, because it's kind of Posey's, in a sense, the old guard now, and Wilson, who overtook him for the All Star voting, is the mm-hmm. new guard. And and again, you, you we'll get into the All Star stuff, but you can't blame the Cubs fans for voting their guy in. We had the same exact chance that they had, so. It's not like they had some unfair advantage. There was no meddling in this election. Cubs fans just did their job. Mm-hmm. And and you can't argue with that. But there's no. a lot of them now, and that's how it always happens. Like you said, it's cyclical. You know, I guarantee you in the late 80s, A's fans were coming out of the woodwork when the Bash brothers were doing their thing, and people were like, oh, yeah, I've been an A's fan all my life. Did you know they used to play in Philadelphia? What now? You know, you... <laughs> Right. It, it, it's got to happen with every fan base. And, you know, the nice thing about that Cubs series is I guarantee you just the Cubs themselves, the players, they walked away from that series shaking their heads going, my gosh, I hope we don't see these Giants in October. I know. Because I've watched a lot of Cubs baseball this year, and nobody has played the Cubs like the Giants did. I mean, they, they've been, you know, they, they've come back so many times. Like when they were, when the Giants were up 4 nothing yesterday there was the thought from giants fans of plenty too like oh crap you know they stopped scoring and so here come the cubs the cubs are going to chip their way back in and they did with the bryant home run and then Baez's home run to tie the game but credit to the giants and their bullpen especially Derek rodriguez getting it done late in the game they were able to stay you know keep them off to get the win and generally speaking the cubs will overtake teams they have the most runs scored from the seventh inning on in baseball. They just absolutely feast on bullpens. And the Giants' bullpen just showed up in spades over the last few days. Ray Black mm-hmm. had a scoreless inning. Maranta has actually shown up. I mean, aside from Dyson, everybody looks fantastic. Uh, no, I was really, really happy to see Ray Black. You know, after his first outing was a little bit rocky, it was a, it was a walk, walk, and a bomb. And suddenly yeah. he walked off the mound with an 81 ERA. Um, to see him kind of come back and, and settle down like that. It's, it's been really a contribution for many you know, guys on this team, despite the number of injuries and other issues that this team has had. Here we are. They're 49 and 46, uh, three games back of Arizona in third place. They're also f- uh, four games back for the final wild card spot, but we don't really care about that. Um, they've won what? This is their eighth walk-off of the year, which leads all of baseball. And that's... That was something I didn't realize. Yesterday we were talking about it in the pregame that they had seven walk-offs, which led all of baseball. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then a few innings later, boom, they get their eight. So uh, pretty remarkable. And I think you have a couple other stats here about extra inning games and home series. Well, it's funny because you mentioned that they have eight walk-offs. And that can be taken one of two ways. That can be taken (laughs) as a team that's barely skating by or a team that shows resolve and you know comes back and wins. The Cubs broadcast showed a stat yesterday during the game. The Cubs had 29 come from behind victories most in baseball. The Giants were fourth on that list with 25. And oh. I had no idea. I, I totally don't think of the Giants as a comeback team. But no, I mean it shows. They're they're 7 and 3 in extra inning games. It's the best market in the National League. Only the Mariners at 8 and 0 and I think the Blue Jays at 8-3 and three have more extra inning wins than them. And they haven't lost a series at home since the second series at home of the year. When they dropped 2-3 or three to Arizona after the home, opening homestand against the Mariners, uh-huh. since then they've gone 10-0-2. Oh, and, and the two splits are what, the Cardinals and, hell, I don't even know who the other one was, probably the Rockies. But they do not lose series at home, and that's what a good team needs to do is to continue winning those games at home because you keep winning two out of three, two out of three. We've talked about it. That is going to keep you in it. Now, the road record, that's a totally different story. But uh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, they haven't had a a winning road series yet or a road uh, trip this year. In fact, they started off that last road trip by sweeping, uh, but then they immediately got swept by the Rockies to end 
five hundred for that road trip, and it was one of those like, oh, they're finally going to get a winning road record. Yes, yes, and then <laughs> nothing. No, it was I mean, July, uh, June thirtieth to July. Off the top of my head, July, June thirtieth to July fifth, July sixth. There was a day off when they went to Pittsburgh and Detroit last year. They took four of six on that road trip. Yeah, it's been over a year since they've had over a winning. A year. Yeah, winning road, winning road trip at all. They're like nineteen and twenty nine on the road, which I think is the second worst in the National League. I wrote a whole thing on two out hits about whether or not they can make the playoffs with a losing road record. Mm-hmm. And I looked back over the last six years in the double wild card era at how many teams actually made the playoffs with a losing road record. And surprisingly, twenty percent of the playoff teams in that span had losing road records. Mm-hmm. But then they got to the playoffs, and none of them did anything. None of them did anything, yeah. No, they had a combined losing record on the road in the 16-32 and 32 on the road in the playoffs. And Detroit, in 2012, was the only team to have a losing record on the road during a season to make the World Series. And we know how that ended. Yes. They got swept. I mean, they they got their ass handed them in San Francisco, and then the pitching shut them down. So the Giants, as, as good as all these home wins are, and they need to keep it up, they're going to have to step up their road game in the second half. No doubt. No, no question about that. I mean, they can't continue to Jekyll and Hyde this thing. Continue their winning ways at home, absolutely. But their road record's got to get better. Even if they played 500 the rest of the year and still ended yep. up with a losing road record, you just got to play better. You can't continue to increase that losing percentage or play at that clip. You've got, you got to increase it at least a little bit. So hopefully that'll happen. A little uh, side anecdote. Um, one of the guys that I work out with at my uh, CrossFit gym, his name is Paul Jimenez. And he's the father of uh, Major League catcher Chris Jimenez. He uh, grew up here. And it is pronounced Jimenez, by the way. It's with a G. I know. It's, it looks like Jimenez, but it's, it's Jimenez. And um, he grew up here in Gilroy. Went to Gilroy High School. And uh, uh, so I've gotten to know his father really, really well. Uh, he's a really, really fun guy. Um, so I've kind of half followed Chris's career over the last three years because of knowing Paul. And, you know, he's, he's been a journeyman backup catcher. Uh, to be honest, I mean, look, his, he's he made his major league debut in 2009, uh, and he only has what 22 home runs, 63 RBI, 83 RBIs. He has a career batting average of 216. He has 194 hits. That's through his career, not like one season, right? So he has very limited playing opportunities. However, um, he was uh, uh, signed by the Cubs this year, and he started it uh, in Iowa City. And uh, Paul was telling me because he's 34, 35 years old now. He's 35. Uh, he said, yeah, Chris is thinking about hanging it up soon. He's, he's hoping he gets called up, you know, one more time here. And he did. He got called up in May for the Cubs. And so he played all of June. And Paul was so excited because the Cubs were coming to San Francisco, of course, with this most recent series. And he occasionally will fly out usually once or twice a year to whatever team he's on. You know, it's been the Rangers. It's been the Twins. It's been the Indians. Uh, he's played for, you know, I think five or six teams at least. And uh, he'll go out and, and have a tour with him and catch up with his son and go what, catch a few games. But he loves it when he's like, oh, he's in the National League now. He's going to come to San Francisco. This is great. This is great. Um, but he was <laughs> he was DFA'd on July 4th. So, yeah. I mean, just like a week before the Cubs series. So last week, I hadn't realized this. I was talking to Chris or to Paul, and I was like, hey, you excited about the series next week? He's like, No. <laughs> I was like, what? He's like, oh, Chris got DFA'd. I was like, what? I felt sorry for the guy. Um, but, you know, he's he's playing. He was playing behind Contreras and, of course, the um, whatever. Wu-Tini Caratini. Guy. Caratini. Yeah, Caratini. Yeah, Caratini. yeah, Victor Caratini. So, yeah, it was interesting to hear some of the – I won't share this on because it's in confidence, but some of the inner workings and – kind of where the Cubs are going with their catchers and, and their feelings about it and, and everything. So he may, he may step down from baseball, be given his age and, the, and the, the fact that you know he's probably getting too old to be a backup catcher the, these days. But I, I told Paul, though, I was like, I know your son's frustrated and, and he's just thinking about hanging it up and everything. But, dude, he played Major League Baseball, like, for years. For years he was in the pros. Like that's amazing. He's played in almost every stadium. He has hundreds of at bats. He has twenty two home runs. Like he's caught, you know, you Darvish and, and all these amazing other, you know, cat I can't think of anyone off the top of my head, but you know, a lot of these main star pitchers and it's like th- that's amazing. And he's like, Oh, I know, I know. Chris Chris will realize that later in life, but right now, you know, 
he's thinking about playing. And so he's not going to reflect on those kinds of things yet. But I know coming from you and me, uh, Eric, that, you know, we would have, if we were blessed with the talent and the, the genes to, to have made it to that yeah. plateau, that would have been incredible just to even have a cup of coffee, you know? In a heartbeat. I would have, I would love to trade places with a guy like that. It's funny. Jimenez, the talk around the Cubs was Jimenez was brought in to pretty much be you Darvish's caddy, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. to be his, his catcher. And you has been injured for most of the season. And it, the Cubs kind of had to finally make a decision. Do we keep Jimenez here or do we bring Caratini up? And they, they finally hit that crossroads. And Caratini was brought up and Jimenez gets, you know, lost in the shuffle because he was pretty much signed for that singular purpose. I don't know if this is what Dad said at all. This is just kind of what I've, I've observed. And it's funny, though, because I just went through Jimenez's Twitter feed, and when he first got DFA'd, some fan comes on and says, oh, yeah, that's great because he's trash. And he retweeted with, no, actually, I recycle. And <laughs> so you can tell he, he has his head on him about a little bit about it, you know, what's going on. On and and then I saw he's been posting pics of him drinking wine, sitting on his front porch, you know, kind of getting into the flow of maybe I'm not playing baseball anymore. Uh, but it, yeah. it is a shame, you know. It's a shame though for for Dad to be like, oh, oh yeah, he's in our league. I'm gonna get to see him. Oh crap! I mean, yeah. that's gotta be such a such a gut punch. I've gone back and forth with Chris over Twitter a couple of times, talking about his dad and saying, "Hey, we're with your dad. He's he's always keep catching up with you, you know, with me about you and this and that." And he's all oh, great to hear, you know. Hope to meet you one day. That's cool that you're working out with my dad. He needs it, you know. He's old and fat or something, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So he seems like a pretty pretty nice guy, but um, yeah, that that's what I had read too. That because of his experience with Hugh Darvish on the Rangers, that's why the Cubs signed him. Um, Paul said that wasn't necessarily the reason, but you know, who knows, right? It, it's right. maybe they don't want to believe it or maybe that's not what they think. But I, I agree with you. I think he was signed to handle Darvish and with his injuries and just the inability for him to come back, they finally had to make a decision and they said, okay, we got, we got to get this guy reps and it's getting to the point now where it's diminishing returns on Jimenez. So they just decided to, to cut him loose, which is, which is unfortunate an- because, you know, last year they didn't think. He didn't think that he was going to get signed anywhere because of his age and lack of production, but uh, he was. The Cubs took a chance on him, but he only got one month with them in the in the majors. He's got a chance to win a ring, you know, and and you no, can't really true. complain about that. He he absolutely has a chance to win a ring, and it's funny. I, I'm going to take this. You know, we talked about Texas and you Darvish, and I know it's a little bit down there, but. Texas and the Rangers they popped up in the Giants' news Hard to work on over the weekend. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. It was a pop-up window. Sorry about that. <laughs> the uh, the Giants and the Rangers made a trade over the weekend to get rid of Corey Guerin and Austin Jackson to lead the way for young Stephen Duggar and Ray, uh, not so young Ray Black to, to come in and help the ball club. And it, it, to me, I, I know we can get a little more into the meat of it. Jackson, as you mentioned here, was DFA'd by Texas. But it's almost similar to 2010 when the Giants got rid of Molina to clear the way for Buster. Yeah. At least yeah, that's the, my take on it. Well, and, and I was reading more into this deal, and of course it was clearly a salary dump by the Giants because as they approach the deadline here, um, they're right up against the luxury tax, and they don't want to really go over it, or at least not go over it by too much uh, to pay too many penalties and taxes. So they said, we need to clear some stuff. So they cleared out um, you know, $6 million dollars, uh, basically from Garen, who's making 1.68, and, and Austin Jackson, who's making 6 over 2. And uh, they also traded away uh, Jason Barr, who is a prospect at Class A San Jose right now. He's actually been pitching fairly well. I was reading a little bit more into his background. He's got an interesting story, actually, um, when you read about it. He's kind of a comeback kid sort of guy. Uh, so he was doing really well for Class A San Jose. And the the view from Texas, because I saw a lot of fans were getting all pissed about it. Some Rangers fans were getting pissed about it, saying, why are we taking this guy for, you know, we we got to pay the majority of his contract, roughly $4.5 million for the next year and a half. Why the hell are we doing it? Well, they essentially did it to essentially buy, quote unquote, Jason Barr. That's kind yeah. of their view. And so they wanted to get that pitching prospect. Uh, they, they, they get Corey Guerin, who can provide some bullpen help. They didn't care about Austin Jackson, to be honest. And Sure enough, they, they, they traded for him, then tried to retrade him right away, couldn't find any suitors, and they just realized, oh, no one's going to want to take up his salary. 
We we took a salary to get the prospect. No one else is good. It's kind of like anyone want this? Uh, you know this this cold uh, seven layer dip that we just bought? No. All right, just throw it away. But we got this nice fresh cold Slurpee in, instead. So, you know it's the way it is. It's the way baseball works. So Austin Jackson has now got to clear waivers to see where he goes next, or if he stays with the Rangers in their minor league system. But you know, to be honest, when we when he signed with the Giants this year, I remember talking about it, saying. You know, he's a serviceable center fielder, but offensively he was hitting lefties extremely well in the American League. It just didn't happen this year for him. Uh, I thought his production was going to be much better. We knew he was going to be a spot starter uh, and a backup outfielder for the most part, um, but it just didn't work out for him. He just he just didn't have that level of production that we were hoping. And defensively, he certainly didn't wow us, I would say. I'm not saying he was a liability, but I don't think he wowed anyone. Yeah, I, I did not mind the trade because it's also great to see Steven Duggar and seeing Steven Duggar's family at the ballpark was, you know, fantastic too. Amy G talking to his mom. You, you obviously didn't see it because you were at the game Monday night. Uh, Amy G talked to Steven Duggar's mom and his sister was there, his high school oh, coach, cool. and, his, mm-hmm. and his nana was there as well. And it was funny during yesterday's game, the later the game got, the closer they moved down seats. And, and like the cameras uh. kept cutting to them. And, <laughs> I mean, it's just it's good to see Duggar. There are plays. Duggar Duggar's promotion does more than just make center field better. It made left field better because Gorky slid over to left field, and he'll probably have the majority of starts in left field. And that means the Giants now have three center fielders: Gorky's, Duggar, and Kutch controlling mm-hmm. the outfield. And it, it has made their outfield defense that much better. There, there are some plays Duggar's already made where it's like he made that look easy, but it wasn't. You know, those line drives. That, you know how line drives can knuckle when they're coming out to the outfield Absolutely. at you. Mm-hmm. You know, and based on Gorky sliding over, there were a couple of plays Gorky's made. You know, drifting from left center to the line to catch a ball uh, that just Pence would not have gotten there. I mean, Slater might have made the play. But, you know, Pence would not have gotten there. Even maybe Austin Jackson, Mac Williamson wouldn't have gotten there. So by bringing him up, it, it just it made everybody better. And it, it kind of showed in these last three games that aside from Hunley's mishap, the Giants defense was phenomenal, especially that that game Monday that you were at. Brandon Crawford was oh. unbelievable. Like there was just like so much. There was like so many ground balls that he was able to there was. There was one double play where Hanson kind of got it to him funny, but he grabbed it, kicked the bag, fired the ball, like no problem. Mm-hmm. He made a barehanded play. You know, Giants defense in general got better, and I think, you know, the youth infusion of bringing Duggar up and, and bringing Black up, I, I it was one of those moves that you make a move without making a move. You know, you kind of rattle the clubhouse a little bit and get some new life in there, and the Giants looked like a team playing with new life recently. Yeah, Duggar came up and had that hustle double in his debut game on Sunday against the Cardinals. Um, I know he's only hitting two thirty-five right now. It really doesn't matter. We got to wait till the, the kid has like seventy, eighty at bats. I hope they that Bochi obviously plays him consistently, um, and I know they have Austin Slater too. Uh, you know, Slater and and Duggar had been tearing up PCL. Darno had been doing well down there too. He's up now. He made some nice plays over at third. Uh, it is nice to see this youth movement. Um, I just don't know where it's going to head because we've seen this before, right, with Mac Williamson and others where they have their flashes in the pan. It, it, it seems so far anyway. And and they have this immediate production or a, a bubble of production, and then it just, you know, pisses out basically. So I'm really hoping that one of these guys sticks over the next year or two. Like this is the incoming class of the next Posey and Crawford and Belt and Panic, right? I mean, this is what... The Giants need they need this youth movement because they don't have a huge stock down there. They don't have uh, a, a lot of trade bait right now to get established veterans. They need this to basically reload if they want to stay competitive, not just this year, but in the next two or three years, because they can't keep trading away prospects at the deadline to try and get that mid, you know, inning reliever or that outfielder to help down the, the stretch as a rental. It's just it's just not going to consistently and continually work as they deplete their reserves. So. Uh, these are the guys they need to develop, and and one way to develop them, especially if there's a crowd down in in uh, Sacramento, is to bring them up and see how they do, and see how you know they test against the big boys. Uh, I will say, most games I've seen, of course, are from the press box lately, 
And I've seen my fair share of amazing plays by Brandon Crawford. But the angle in which I was watching the game on Monday, and he had four just incredible plays that night. Just absolutely incredible. It was really interesting to see it from behind Crawford and more of a line between the shortstop position and first base. Because especially the one where he slid to his left, popped up and yeah. fired to first, and then the one where he came in and barehanded it and fired to first, I was kind of like right behind him, pretty much lined up with first base so I could see the ball trajectory from that angle, which is a fun angle to look at. You know what I mean? You're not looking at it from high up or across. So you can, right when he releases the ball, you know from your point of view, where it's going. You see that little bit of the tail from the right-hander as it bows you know, from the left down back to the right to, to belt. It was really fun to watch. And just to see the velocity in which he throws it from that position, it was really cool to see. I, I really enjoyed watching him that day. And then he was just, just on fire, just on fire. Yeah, that throw you're talking about on the slide one, that was all arm. He couldn't get anything mm-hmm. but his arm on that throw. And it was still a dart right on. I've never seen a guy impact a game without getting a hit as much as he did that day because oh. i think he went like over five that day but he kept them in the game with his plays I, I know one of them was you know with runners threatening or something like that oh he I saved all at least three or four base hits i mean i'm sure yeah. he saved eventually a run or two in the game no doubt he saved the game defensively for them so like you said you don't always have to contribute offensively um and in fact he's been a bit of a slump which we'll talk about later but defensively, it doesn't affect them. And I I think that's great. And in the major leagues, you have to have the mentality when you're having a bad day at the plate, you just, you cannot take it with you on the field. Because if you do, you're going to have a bad day on the field as well. Uh, And he doesn't. (laughs) He was just, he was money out there, no matter that he went 0 for whatever, 0 for 5. Uh, He was fantastic that day. You know, it's funny, we're going to talk about him going to the All-Star game, but... uh... I wanted to double back. We didn't mention that Johnny Cueto pitched his second game at, since mm-hmm. coming off the disabled list yesterday. And I agree with your assessment here if you want to. Yeah, so he did come off the DL. He's I don't have his stats up with me right now. I should have brought him up. But um, he was obviously rocky in both starts. The second start was a little bit better, which was yesterday. I was watching it. Um, took a little break from work. Went down to the bar. Kind of watched a little bit. Um, <laughs> it was the end of the... Uh, of Croatia and England uh, in overtime, and then once that ended, uh, we switched it over to the Giants game, and you know saw it was four to one. I was feeling pretty good about it, and the very first inning I saw uh, was the one in which Chris Bryant hit the two run home run to bring it back to four to three. But I had missed the the at bat he had before. I didn't see it until highlights later, where he hit it off the very end of the bat, and obviously got snake bit with the reverberation up the bat. And so he did admit later uh, in the the post game press conference that that he felt it the next inning but he didn't want to use as 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 an excuse he had a little bit of numbness and tingling going on and you could see that and and maybe it had affected him that inning because otherwise he would have had a fine outing he would have probably given up one run over five innings and said it was three over five so it wasn't disastrous he said he felt really really good and he did make progress from the last start but i tell you what they got a baby this guy and it's unfortunate because he has a tenuous elbow situation right now that ligament had a partial tear in it and, you know, and, and two months off may not have been enough to fully heal it. So they have to be very careful with him. And I'm sure he's going to be on a pretty stringent pitch count. And Bochi admitted that they talk to him after every single start now. They're just going to be like, how's it feeling? How's it going? Can we take a look at it? Because uh, they need to make sure that, that they protect his elbow, especially since he has another couple years uh, left on his contract. But in the long run, I'm not too worried about him. You you got to give him, you know, the benefit of the doubt. He dominated down in his rehab starts. He had no issues down there. The first, the first start back, you might be a little shaky, nervous, have the adrenaline flowing. You kind of go, okay, it's a first start, no big deal. Second start again, it was one mistake to Chris Bryant that really inflated the numbers. Uh, so overall, I'm not too worried. I'm glad to have Cueto back, um, even though the youth movement in terms of the starting pitching has really, really impressed both of us. Uh, I think we both clearly want Cueto back. Yeah, he is absolutely the number two starter behind Bumgarner, regardless of how the the young guys have been pitching. And he's actually he's going to help turn Shark into trade bait. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, the Yankees are kicking the tires on Smarzja, which blows my mind. I, I can't see him pitching in that stadium. Oh my god! But the nice thing with Cueto is he pitched yesterday, which was Wednesday, July 11th. 
He's probably not going to pitch again until either Saturday, July 21st or Sunday, July 22nd after the break. Because right. this weekend, as, as you shared yesterday, it's going to be Bumgarner Friday, Shark Saturday, Suarez on Sunday. And then they've got the All-Star break. They come back that Friday against Oakland. And we all know Bum's going to start that Friday game against Oakland. He doesn't have to go for the All-Star game. There's nothing getting in the way. He can pitch on his normal rest. So by pushing Cueto back a day, it actually gave him a chance to be pushed back a few days after the fact, too. Mm Because they might have felt like they wanted to pitch Cueto this Sunday if he had pitched the Tuesday game, but now they're not going to rush him back to do it. And hopefully that gives him time. Yeah, Because that pitch to Bryant, it was a mistake. It was a pitch up. It was just fat, and he knocked the crap out of it. And and it wasn't like he just got beat by Bryant. No, that was a bad pitch. But other than that, I mean, the shimmy was working pretty good. Uh, he, He managed to keep the ball in the ballpark, I guess, on the ground. And I, I'm not too worried about him. I no. I thought I would be after that first. It was just last Friday when he gave up four runs in the first inning of the Cardinals. It was just like, oh, man, you know, <laughs> did they rush him back? They should just I start know. Holland. And, and now the Giants are in a position of strength from their starting rotation. And, and it's, again, to the, the youth movement, but Cueto is absolutely going to be the number two starter. I'm, I, I expect the rotation after the All-Star break to be some sort of Bumgarner, Cueto, Suarez, Shark, Rodriguez. You know, Rodriguez and Shark might mix it up a little bit there, but that mm-hmm. that's probably what the rotation is going to be. Chris Stratton is now in the minors, and even then they're not starting him. They're keeping him on side sessions right now. So the Giants are, are in a position of strength. You know, Ty Block comes in and does wonders on Monday night. They're, they're totally in a position of strength to let Cueto not have to rush back. You know, because of Derek Holland and his ability to both start and be in the bullpen, that gave Cueto the extra day this time around. And it's not that they're necessarily, you know, I mean, you said it, they're babying him. They're totally treating him with kid gloves when they need to. If he was a rookie, after that bat stinging incident happened yesterday, he would have been oh, out. He's of the out. Game. He's, yeah. he's coming out. Yeah, absolutely. He's, he's earned well, the right to go back out there. Yeah, and because and, he came right into the fifth and, you know, what, he had a four pitch walk pretty much right away. And then, yes. you know, the, the, the Bryant bomb. And, and that was another incident where it's like, yeah, young guy, he's out of there. He's, he's too shaken up. He had some, some issues with the stinging, you know, because Morant, I think, at the time uh, was, was warming up. Maybe his block. Uh, anyway. Not yet. Uh, yeah. So, but, you know, Bochi's like, look, he's my veteran. He knows how to handle the situation. He will, he, you know, I'm going to give him a chance to come back. And also, by the way, to get the win, it didn't work out because later Baez hit that one off of Watson, which was like, wow, that was, that is impressive. I mean, Watson just doesn't give up Jack, you know, to anyone. And Baez swung out of his shoes. I mean, you see that replay and he was, I mean, that was 110% effort there, man. And he just, he crushed it to dead center. So, um, he didn't get the win, but Bochi had the, the faith in him and it worked out. And, you know, the other thing, he, he struck out seven. He struck out seven in five innings. Yes. So despite the bomb and, and, and uh, kind of, you know, six hits, which was a little high and two walks, he had, he had seven strikeouts. So I think that's, that bodes well. So I agree with you. I think the future of the rotation is something like a, a bum, Cueto, um, Rodriguez and, and Suarez and, uh, and Shark. I, 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 Stratton's in the minors. I mean, he had very promising starts at the beginning of the year, and obviously he's tailed off. Ty Block has become very effective, by the way, out of the bullpen for yeah. mid relief. I think he's actually been doing very, very well. Uh, but Rodriguez and Suarez lately have just been on fire. And so I think you got to ride those hot hands. And, and then Shark, who knows what, what happens or what's going to happen with him. I did hear yesterday that report that the Yankees were kicking the tires on him, and part of me was kind of like, hey, okay, go ahead. Let's see what you got. Let's see what you got because they, they have a pretty loaded minor league system. And it would be amazing if the Giants could actually replenish some of their minor leagues by getting rid of Shark. But I think if a situation like that arose, I'm sure the Yankees would be like, you need to eat most of, or at least half of his contract or something like that. It, it's going to be some sort of arrangement, which the Giants I don't think are going to do. But you know, even if they have his salary and keep him on the books the next two years, maybe they would do it if they got the right prospects. I don't know. Uh, yeah, but it would have to be interesting. The, yeah, it'd have to be the right kind of deal. And, and yeah. you mentioned Rodriguez yesterday. It's so funny because Javi Baez went from hero to later in the game. Uh, I was I was reading Baggerly's piece about yesterday, and Derek Rodriguez was singing the praises of Buster Posey. 
and he froze Javi Baez with a changeup. Mm-hmm. So much so that Javi kind of smiled at him and said something, and you could see D-Rod smile as he came off the mound and acknowledged back. And he hadn't thrown a changeup all day. And Buster called the pitch because he and, – and Rodriguez is like, he's just got amazing feel back there. They work really well together, Rodriguez and Posey. Posey seems to really think in step with him. And, you know, he's like, even though I hadn't thrown the pitch, you know, Posey called for it. I trust him. I threw it. It worked. You know, it, it, it's – it's because of guys like that, that Shark... Now, we hope Shark has a great start on Saturday. I, I thought his last start against St. Louis was not bad. Mm-hmm. You know, he only gave up, I believe, three runs. There's three runs, and, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like Homer happy. And, and honestly, they weren't barreling him up that often. So, you know, the hope for the Giants is his next start or next two or three starts, if he is a trade target for other teams, the hope is that he keeps this up. I mean, you want that for wins, but you also want it for the possibility of trades. And honestly, if they have to keep Shark, they have to keep Shark. It, it, it's it's probably going to be okay. I can't imagine he's going to be as bad as he was earlier this year. He just couldn't seem to get loose. He couldn't seem to stay consistent. And he's already shown signs that he's better than that. Yeah, it's just funny. He's he's always been an innings eater, and that's been one of his most valuable assets he brings to the team. And he has his string of good starts. He'll have a great start. This is traditionally over the last couple of years. And then I'll have a couple Homer Happy ones. Then he has another, you know, shutout over seven. And then a couple Homer Happy. That's the way he's always been. His ERA has always hovered around four, you know, 4.2, kind of like that. So if he goes back down to that level, hey, look, that's better than most of the league average. So it's just a little too expensive for, for our tastes, of course, in terms of payroll. Uh, but the Giants, you know, look, he's been healthy up until this year with the Giants. Evan Longoria had never played less than 155 games over the last eight years. Boom, he gets hurt. Madison Bumgarner, we all know what he did last year with the bike and now this year with the line drive. I, they've been kind of snake bitten by injuries to guys who traditionally have not gotten hurt in the past. So it, it's been quite frustrating in that regard. Um, but the Giants are still hanging in there, man. Three games back, so so we'll take it. So I want to talk about the All-Star game. Uh, we left you a couple of weeks ago with Posey and Crawford leading their respective positions in the National League. But we saw Wilson Contreras coming, and we talked about it then. He had made considerable strides in closing the gap between the two, and I think he was only a couple hundred thousand behind Posey in the last count. And sure enough, he did overtake Posey, and, and he got the starting nod. But we had discussed, because we knew that he, he had been going through some injury issues, that... Maybe he just needs the time off, and it's okay if he doesn't make the all-star team. In fact, it might be better for the Giants if he doesn't travel all the way to D.C. and, and put all that stress on his body and just spends time with uh, you know his family and a little rest and rehab. Uh, he was, of course, selected by the players as a backup or a reserve, but they revealed that he officially does have this hip injury that he's been dealing with all year. And he said... Basically, we wouldn't have known about it if he wasn't selected as an all-star, but he had to kind of, they had to disclose the injury for him to, to bow out. So, so he has been dealing with a hip injury all year, and he's been getting cortisone shots and that kind of thing. Um, and it, he says he just can't drive with his legs. It just, it's apparent that he's, his power drought this year especially has really come from the hip injury. And um, he can still hit the opposite way, which ironically, look what he did yesterday. So he can drive it that way. He just can't really pull the ball too well because of his his injury. But it's the catching that you just alluded to that makes him probably more valuable now in terms of defense than ever because of the way he's handling these young pitchers and the way they're raving about him. I mean, when they announced that he wasn't going to play in the All-Star game, uh, then there were rumors that, oh, he might just take the rest of the first half off Again, you know, the rest against the Cubs and then all of Oakland to then transition into the um, the break and then get like a solid 10 days off. And here he is catching a 13 inning game. You know, I mean, it's just incredible to see this guy in his guts and he ends up getting the game winning hit uh, uh, yesterday. So I look, I have a lot of, of applause for Buster Posey. I think he's a great player. He's, he's not having the year that we're used to seeing from him, but. He's contributing in other ways and certainly being a leader on this team. Um, so I'm pretty excited about it and, and pretty excited the fact that he was selected. So it goes on his resume, but he's not going. So as Giants fans, we know he's going to rest and take care of it. 
Yeah, it's the best of both worlds. It's exactly what I called for last time we recorded. Like, literally, when the notification came through that said, Buster Posey is bowing out of All-Star Game to hip, I, I tweeted it with, yes! Because yeah. I'd rather he rested. The guy caught 24 innings over the last three days, but he only caught two games. Uh, I mean, that that's some wear and tear on the body between the 13 and the 11. And thank goodness that Norwood kid for the Cubs throws 97. Because that supplied most of the power to get that ball off the bricks over <laughs> Bryant's head. Uh-huh. And, and you know, Buster was able to. It's funny. He was batting fourth yesterday, and it was kind of like, why? And then when you saw the lineup construction, it was because there was nobody else to bat fourth. You know, but the credit to the Giants for, A, recognizing what's been going on. And uh, I was reading, Greshner said that, Posey is one of the most cognizant players of what he puts into his body, what his training regimen is. So this isn't some guy who's taking it lightly. You know, he's really working hard to it. And the whole goal is to be able to have him as fresh as he can be in September and October because this team has playoff aspirations. And the long-term picture is so much more important than the short term. Like, I guarantee he's going to – probably catch only two games this weekend and then when they come back from the break they go to oakland and i'll bet you he dh's they go to oakland and seattle and i'll bet oh, yeah. you he he's DHs. DH almost every game yeah yeah what when he's not catching they will have him dh and mm-hmm. like you said with the pitching staff and just in the clubhouse there's just numerous ways that he contributes and People are worried about a decline, and let's be honest, there is a slight decline, but that's what's going to happen when the guy has been squatting for 10 straight years. It's just going to happen. He's not going to shift to first base because what are you going to do? Trade away Brandon Belt? That ain't happening. They just signed mm-hmm. him to a contract extension. You know, Can he maybe take over third base? Nope, Longoria is there until like at least 2021. You're not going to stick him in the outfield because he's slow as molasses. So you got to utilize his best assets – as much as you can and if that means giving him a break every few days then you give him that break i mean posey wants to be out there just as much as anybody else you know he's not like loafing he's not taking days off i've seen giants fans i saw it on reddit the other day oh hunley's better and that's just not true oh boy it, mm. it's not even true just because hunley has a few home runs whoop de doo mm. uh would you i would always still rather have buster posey at the plate in the 13th inning with the bases loaded or runners on first and third, then I would Nick Hundley. And, and Nick's got a walk-off this year. But, you know, Nick's, Nick's got a couple games where, hey, that was the Hundley game. Hey, he hit four hits this game. Hey, he had three hits this game. So people tend to remember that stuff, and they don't think about those little things like Buster bringing along the pitching staff and working with Suarez and Rodriguez. There was a day, I think it was during the Cardinal series, Buster had the day off. And this was before Stratton got sent down. So maybe it was still during the Colorado series. And the three guys next to Buster in the dugout during the entire game were Andrew Suarez, Derek Rodriguez, and Chris Stratton. And that is so valuable that you just can't put a number on it. There's no metric for that. You know, clubhouse presence and knowledge, there's just no way to quantify something like that. And that's mm-hmm. why a guy like Buster Posey is going to stay. That's why he is elected an all-star by his peers. His peers are not just looking at, oh, well, he's got, what, like five home I don't think it's four or five home runs this year. And, five, yeah. Oh, he's hitting, yeah, he's hitting under 300. You know, no, they look at the entirety of the game. And thanks to Buster bowing out, Yadier Molina gets to add another freaking All Star game to his resume. No, no, I know. That, I would. I was a little frustrated with that. That Molina replaced him. I was like, ah, oh, damn it. Oh well. Of all the guys. Of all the guys. Nobody likes Molina. Yeah, nobody likes Molina. But it's good for Buster. He gets the nod. And Crawford ran away with the shortstop portion of it. We we knew it was. You know, the guy who got hosed in all of this because first base is so loaded was Brandon Belt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as you mentioned, Crawford easily won his position, which has been well-deserved. He just started dipping under 300. he He's been in a bit of a slump. Um, he's definitely been cold over the last month, but as we just talked about, his defensive wizardry and I guess the notoriety, it was, it's, it's, it's a bit surprising. It's like these aren't just Giants fans voting for Brandon Crawford because he, in those years, especially the World Series years, where you saw guys like Joe Panic near the top of the list, right? You know that Giants fans are pumping the ballots full a lot of the ways like Cubs and Braves fans did this year, right? Um, but Crawford is definitely a household name now, which it's hard to kind of keep your 
your finger on the pulse of how the nation responds to Giants players. They know about Buster Posey and Madison Bumgarner, but it just seems like Brandon Crawford's always been kind of in the shadows. It's kind of like, oh yeah, he's that guy from the Giants, I think. But the fact that he just clobbered the shortstop position with a lot of national votes, there's definitely that that respect that's coming in from at least the fans this year. And you're right, Brandon Belt, it's a, it's a crowded position. Before his his appendectomy, he was right up there with Freddie Freeman in production. In fact, he was leading him in OPS and, and on-base percentage, and we talked about it about a month or two ago. Uh, but, you know, that absence definitely hurt him, and so he kind of fell off the radar. He was put in, selected for the final vote, and obviously Derek Holland and Hunter Pence had that hilarious video, which is WWE style, coming out with the belt, you know, talking about belt or balloting or yeah, belting the ballot or whatever, and they were going, oh, yeah, and, you know, <laughs> doing all that great stuff. Derek Holland literally used baby oil and applied it all over his naked chest to uh, really fully seal the deal, and Hunter Pence kind of served back up in the tank top. But uh, it was hilarious. It was, it was a lot of fun. He did fall short. He did, he did finish second in the voting. Uh, but, uh, I mean, come on. <laughs> we we got to be honest here. Jesus Aguilar completely deserved it. I mean, the fact that he wasn't selected originally is kind of embarrassment. You know, he's leading the National League in slugging and home runs. He's hitting 302, 64 RBI, and he wasn't on the All-Star team at that point. So, as a ba- again, a baseball purist, it's like, okay, he deserves it. Brandon Belt, I would have loved to have seen Belt there, but Aguilar deserved it. So I have no qualms with that. And he's in the home run derby, too. Yeah, you look, too, at the National League. It is loaded with first basemen right now. The three guys that are on the team are Freeman, Votto, and Goldschmidt. Yeah. And none of those guys are going to bow out. They're, they're all having decent years. Well, Goldschmidt's, you know, so-so. But he's had his streaks. But none of those guys are going to bow out. So as soon as Belt lost the final vote, regardless of Derek Holland and Hunter Pence's push for him, oh, my God, still, that was awesome. There's no way for Belt to get on the team. So he's just going to have to rest during the All-Star break like everybody else. And quickly back to the Ballot Brothers thing, though. Apparently, Derek Holland and Brandon Belt ride into games together. This is something I learned the other day on MLB Network Radio. Oh. And Holland told Belt that he was going to do something for him, but he didn't tell him what. And <laughs> Belt you know, said he, he, he was kind of embarrassed, but not really, because he said it's the best edit video he's ever seen on the Internet. And, I mean, Derek Holland, I mean, just as a quick aside, the way that this guy has integrated himself into both the clubhouse and the fan base – has been something to see. Like, I was going back and forth with Holland uh, Tuesday night after his start. Uh, there's there's a Dodgers writer, he writes for Forbes, Howard Cole. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know him through the Internet Baseball Writers Association. And I after the first inning, I tweeted, Holland looks good. A- and Howard came back with, you know, yeah, you know, talk to me in three runs or whatever. And I said, I hope I can get six innings. After the game, Holland hopped into that conversation with a meme of, I don't know who it was, laughing at Howard and pointing the finger like, ah, ha, 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 you moron. You know, I, I mean, what other player is interacting like that, doing these things? They did a second video yesterday afternoon before the end of the All-Star voting, and not only did he oil up, he had Amy G with permanent marker draw abs on him because Derek Holland has kind of the same beer gut. I do. And <laughs> he, he's like, I want some abs, you know, for it. And you can just tell that he is one of those guys in the clubhouse that just makes the team better, that keeps the team fresh. And, and you need guys like that. You know, him going out and throwing six shutout innings the other day, that's like the cherry on top almost, which is why I think it's going to be hard for them to look to move him or get him out of the clubhouse because he's just absolutely integrated. After every walk off victory, he dumps the water bottles. They cut to him in the dugout in the ninth inning yesterday of filling up the water bottle thing, getting ready for the walk-off that happened four innings later. Yeah. You know, immediately he runs into the clubhouse and he tweets a picture of Kermit getting dumped with water as the game-winning tweet that. because that's kind of his thing. Yeah, you know, awesome. he, he, he did it on, on Monday night too, and I tweeted back a picture of a bunch of pandas dancing because that was, you know, pandas walk-off. And I mean, and you need guys like that. The, the baseball season is a grind. And as much as these guys are professionals, we all get in the same doldrums with our jobs. There are times you don't want to go to work. There are times I don't want to go to work. It happens. But if you have a guy like that to help loosen things up, it helps out. And it was just so fun to hear Belt talk about 
how he and Alan drive into games together, and it's like, that's a friendship none of us had any idea existed. Yeah, I didn't even know that. Okay. Yeah, and I, I thought that that was kind of neat, neat to hear. you know. And, and to bring it back to Belt, Belt, it's funny, he's been one of their better hitters of the last week. He doesn't have any home runs to show for it. In fact, his power's been down a little bit since the appendectomy. Yeah. But he's still continually going out there, and you know that Brandon-to-Brandon Brandon combo, it's hard to think of a better shortstop first base combination in all of baseball. Yeah. And and, uh, and Bell made a couple of just wonderful picks too the last few yes. days over at first base, especially from Darno and one from Crawford and I mean he's um he's just over there just a cool cucumber just picking that stuff out of the dirt like it's no no big deal. I was going to say Dansby Swanson and Freddie Freeman might be the closest to it, but there, there's just nobody it, Belt is a vacuum. This is the year where he should really get the Gold Glove consideration because he's shown it all year. Like you said, he's scooping balls. If he can't get to it, you know, it's a horrible throw because he's still getting to the horrible throws. And he's doing great on the short hops. And he's not even doing the, you know, the short hop swing where you swing your arm, but your head kind of turns away at the same time. Mm -hmm. He's not even doing that. He's keeping his head down. No, his head's down. I. So I think Belt was deserving of an all-star nod, but I get why he didn't make it. I, I really do. And, you know, the Belt brothers tried. They tried. They, they tried. tried. It was valiant yes. effort, but it didn't quite make it, but that's all right. Um, so you posted here about uh, our friend of the show, Ryan Leong, has passed along a YouTube video. I haven't watched it yet. He, him and I were actually um, texting last night uh, about setting up a, an interview with him and He's going to be at the game on Saturday. I'm going to attend it, too, in the press box. We're going back and forth. And he did mention that he sent us something. So I think this is must be what he was talking about. Yeah, he, he I woke up this morning to this in my inbox, and I actually watched the hour-long thing this morning. Uh-huh. Uh, it's the giant story, A Tale of Two Cities. It's old. It was made in 1986. So, <laughs> like, when they talk about the 62 World Series, they're like, and the Giants haven't been back since. You know, but it, it's really, it's a good little, it's an hour long. Uh, search YouTube for the Giants story, A Tale of Two Cities, and you'll find it. Uh, it's some account like MLB One or something like that. It's fun to watch, though, because it goes back to the days of Christy Mathewson and Carl Hubble. And then it shows how when they moved from New York to San Francisco, how the Giants were received. And there are just some great players through Giants history that, that aren't always mentioned, like, you know, having the all Alu outfield that they had in the 60s. Yeah, the brothers, you know, yeah. Or how Bobby Bonds was looked at as the heir apparent to Willie Mays. You know, those are neat little things to hear about and stories to hear about from the players themselves. You know, the story that I, I shared last time about Willie being 0 for 12 and DeRocher saying, as long as I'm the manager, you're my center fielder. And then Willie going out and hitting one out of the state. DeRocher said it on the thing. He's like, he hit it over the roof of the polo grounds. And that was the beginning of the rest. Yeah. You know, it, it was just, it was fascinating to watch. And if you like that kind of old stuff, it's got a lot of old footage and talks about Carl Hubble in the 1931 All-Star Game, striking out the five straight guys, uh, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Jimmy Fox. I think he struck out five straight Hall of Famers to start that game. It's just, it's a good little history of the Giants. You know, obviously we've had a lot of new history, but it's nice to be reminded of those old times. And coming from an old school fan like myself, you know, it's good to see New York get their, their props because I, you know, I still wear my NY hat every now and then because mm-hmm. that's where they came from. So I just something I figured I'd pass along to the listeners that Ryan Leong, he, he shared it with us. Again, the giant story, A Tale of Two Cities. Check it out on YouTube. Very cool. We'll put it in the show notes as well. All right, let's get to who's hot and who's not. Uh, first of all, who's hot? Um, there wasn't really a long, a long list of guys who have quote, been hot. It's been... Everyone's been kind of average or a little below average, but not kind of at any two ends of the spectrum. But man, Derek Rodriguez, we talked about him before. He has just been on fire. One earned run in his last 13 in, uh, thirteen innings pitched. He came in, of course, yesterday and pitched three scoreless innings to get the win, which was huge. Uh, he's only given up three runs over his last 23 innings. And his ERA is 2.04 over his last six games, which is 34 innings pitched. And of course, he's now lowered his season ERA to, I believe, 2.89 or so. Uh, he might be the real deal. Again, small sample size, but he's uh, proven his worth already for the Giants. 
Yeah, I was really looking forward to him starting the Wednesday game against the Cubs because I wanted to see that matchup. And, you know, based on circumstances, we got to see it. But I, I was really looking forward to, you know, Suarez Monday, Cueto Tuesday, and Rodriguez Wednesday. When he's out there, it, there's no, like, nail-biting. There's no, like, oh, my God, this kid's a rookie. What's going to happen? He seems confident as hell. He seems like he knows what he's doing. And, like, I imagine he's only going to get better from here. Kruko was talking about him, and they were, they were saying, you know, why do you think Bochi trusts him here in the uh... – you know, extra innings. They didn't have many other guys they could go to, don't get me wrong, and he was good to pitch 100 pitches if he needed to in extra innings. So that that wasn't the issue. But as far as just pulling the trigger and saying, yeah, I'm going to put a ro- rookie out there in this rubber game, and Kruko, I think, might have nailed it on the head. He said he grew up in Major League Clubhouses. I mean, exactly. he's he's been around the game. He, this is not, this does not awe him. This does not um, overbear his senses. He knows where he is. He knows he belongs. And his adrenaline is there, but he's not going to let it get the, best, the, the better of himself. So uh, I didn't really think about it in that context because, of course, he is the son of Pudge, uh, that he's been around these guys for really his entire life. And so he knows what the deal is, and he's not going to let the moment get away from him. So that's not going to affect his performance. And his confidence can only build from here. I mean, oh, for sure. You know, it, it, it's it's so funny that the Giants have somehow gotten younger during a season when everybody was worried they were too old. And quiet, surely, quietly, they've, you know, Rodriguez, Suarez, Duggar, Black, they're starting to get these young guys in there. And Rodriguez is like the standout star thus far. You know, as much as I love Suarez, Rodriguez just, like you said, has this calm about him, and it comes from growing up around, you know, such a thing. Barry Bonds had a similar type calm because of growing up around, you know, major league clubhouses. And this Rodriguez kid, I, I keep calling him D-Rod because that's just the easiest nickname <laughs> for him. And it's just so nice to see. And, and talking about young guys, I, I noticed it, like, every time they do a minor league update, Joey Bart, the Giants' first-round draft pick, gets mentioned. He's played a whole six games for Salem-Kaiser in short A. And he's already got five home runs, a grand slam, He's got a double. He's eight for twenty-seven, and, and and that's just six games. Yeah, six games. I mean, I'm not going to say that they're going to fast track Joey Bart, but <laughs> I mean, he played he played six games in the Arizona Instructional League before that. He didn't homer once. He he only had one extra base hit. Suddenly, he gets to better competition in the short A season. His first game of the season, he hits two home runs and drives in four runs. July yeah. 9th against Boise, he hits a grand slam. Just yesterday, you know, it was funny. I knew that he had hit four home runs. I'm like, oh, let's go see how he did. I look at yesterday's box score. Sure enough, Joey Bart, one for four with a home run and two runs driven in. You know, it is it is the short A, and I. but I just wanted to highlight that, you know, the Giants really seem like they made a good pick in Joey Bart. And it's possible we could see him in the big leagues by the end of next year, maybe as a September call-up. I can't see them fast-tracking him to get him up there this year. There's just no point. No. But if he continues to show production, he's going to move his way up through the chain quickly. And it's nice that the Giants keep the old guard in place like Posey with an eye towards the future because Bart is the heir apparent. He absolutely yeah. is the heir apparent. He I is agree. the same as picking Posey 10 years ago. So, it, it, you know, I had to share that he was doing so well in Salem-Kaiser because, I mean, that, that's crazy. The guy's eight hits and f- six of them are fracture bases. Yeah, no, he's he's been exploding off the, the the scene down there in short A, and I, I yeah, they're not going to fast track him in the sense of this year, but next year I do think he's going to be probably in Richmond, you know, Double A, and uh, see how he does there. And he's one of those candidates that could be called right up straight to the show in September when they expand the rosters, uh, or he might you know be seasoned in the PCL. Of course, it is a hitters league, so I don't know how much. He may or may not benefit from that. I think the pitchers league, the double A league, might be better suited for him just to see how he handles the better pitchers, or at least the ballparks and, and the type of pitching. Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, Buster Posey was was somewhat fast track, but Benji Molina was kind of the cog in front of him, and they ended up trading him um, to Texas, and that's what basically freed up the room in 2010 for him to uh, to show up. Or I sorry, was it 2009? The trade was happening. No, happened. it was ten. It was, it was ten. Because Molina, right. yeah, yeah you remember Molina through. was the guy. Because he got two rings. Like he yes, yeah. he was going to win a ring no matter what. You know, as soon yeah. as the World Series was set, he was the guy that was going to win a ring, no matter what. 
That's right. So it was 2010 that happened. And, of course, you know, he exploded on the scene. So I, I could see a similar situation to that. Not that they're trading away Buster Posey in two years to make room for Joey Bart. Uh, but I think, you know, we'll see him in the majors, maybe for a cup of coffee next year. But I think most certainly if he continues, you know, with great production, uh, it's going to be 2020 where he might crack in. And by then, it's going to be interesting to see. I think it's way too far down the road to, to forecast, but <clears throat> is that the time where Buster Posey does make a permanent move? Uh, what What is Belt signed through now, though? Isn't he signed through 2021, oh, though? I think so. Or is it just 2020? Brandon Belt contract. I think it's 2021. And and if you look at the contract at this point, compared to market value on good first basements, Belt looks like a steal. Yeah. But. But by the end of the year, there you go. Looks like a sweet deal. Let's see. So he signed it, yeah, 21. Yeah, So and that's the issue. I mean, you can't move Buster to first base during Belt's contract. You just can't. And he's not going to third because Longoria's here through 2020. He's not going to the outfield like you said. So there is a bit of a logjam, and unless you know Buster Posey just completely breaks down into to rusty parts, he's the catcher for the next few years. And so Joey Bart really has the opportunity to develop in season in the minor leagues. And there's no real reason to rush him, to be honest. Even if he's hitting the crap out of the ball, keep him down there. It's okay. He's young. Um, It's fine. He is the heir apparent to Buster Posey, but there are no rush to get rid of Buster over the next few years. So, But it's great to see him explode onto the scene so well, and and we'll keep an eye on him intermittently through the podcast. Uh, So we can talk about who's not. I know that Brandon Crawford, he won the starting position for shortstops in the National League, but... He was he was a way up at one point at 330. His batting average was just skyrocketing. He has cooled off over the last 30 games and 94 at bats. He only has 19 hits. That's a 202 clip. So his average has dipped down into the 290s. But overall, just an outstanding campaign for him. Again, if he ends the year hitting 250, I have no problem with that, considering his production, his power this year, and his defense. So uh, just just a little cold lately, but you know. We'll see what happens after the break, see if we can pick it back up. Yeah, he's still second on the team with 21 doubles behind McCutcheon, who has 22. You know, like you mentioned, he's got 10 home runs, which is one off the team lead, which is Gorky's Hernandez with 11. Well, I thought Belt's got 13, right? Oh, there it is, Belt. Yeah, I looked at the wrong column. Damn it. Yeah, no problem. But he's third still. (laughs) Gorky's is still the shocker there, though. That's still the – what the hell? Looks like a tie. Yeah, right? Gorky's – Gorky's is the whole reason Austin Jackson, but, you know, we already yeah. covered that. <laughs> He's the whole reason. The, the other guy that hasn't been hot lately, and it's weird because I just mentioned him, Nick Hundley. I, I just, I was, you know, like you mentioned with the who's hot, you know, it's contributions are coming from everywhere, so it's kind of hard to pinpoint one guy. It, the same goes for who's not. Since contributions are coming from everywhere, there's no guy that stands out. Like in my head, I was like, oh, Alan Hansen hasn't been hitting the ball lately. And then I went and looked him up, and oh, yeah, he had three hits the other day against St. Louis. He had that mad dash. You know, so it was tough to pick somebody. And I noticed Nick Hunley, he's just been one for nine in 10, uh, 10 plate appearances over the last five games after he had three hits in Arizona on July 1st. The weird thing that just stuck out to me is the Giants lost each of the last five games that Hundley has appeared in. And, oh. and that's just totally just random and wacky. Yeah, that's but, just a random you know, thing, yeah. It, it was just like, there's nobody else who's not. And I don't know, maybe because I'm so defensive about Buster Posey, I wanted to show that the backup is not, you know. Because <laughs> we know how it is. It's it's the backup quarterback syndrome in football. You know, the guy on the bench is is the most the most loved player on the team is the backup quarterback because everybody thinks he can do better than the starting quarterback. Right. And I feel like Giants fans have kind of got that going with Hundley and Posey lately. It's like, oh, he's hit the ball hard this year. His launch angle is better. Yeah. But he also didn't throw a runner out until this past weekend. I mean, and we're talking – we're into July already. That was three months of the season that Hundley didn't throw out a single base runner. And, you know, he showed it on Tuesday when he threw the ball in the left field when, honestly, he shouldn't even have thrown the ball in the first place. No, if you, you look know, at it was the a play, ball. It, even a perfect throw, he's still safe. He should have just held on to yeah. the ball. I, I yelled, eat it, the moment that the ball got away from him. But, of course, yeah. he didn't hear me. Yeah. <laughs> Through the time they never hear the me. internet. Yeah, I know. They Gosh, never hear me. Go back in time. Hear this. I know it has happened 45 seconds ago, but damn it. You know, uh, I'll, I'll say things watching a game too and Kruko will say it right after me I'll be like Kruko I just said that but in real but realistically Kruko said it before me because like you said I'm on a delay being on the internet (laughs) 
I do love that. I, a lot of times I do watch games. Um, it happened yesterday too at um, the bar. I was with my coworker friend and uh, you know, the speakers are really loud. You could hear Kruk and Kipe talking and something would happen and I'd mention, I'd go, oh, this is going to happen next or this is probably the pitch he's going to call for or he should do this now. And then you'd hear Kruko say the exact same thing just like a second later. And my buddy was like, damn, you really know baseball, huh? But he doesn't know baseball, so he's impressed by anything. But <laughs> I was kind of like, well, yeah, but I think most baseball knowledgeable people would have realized the same thing. I mean, most of what you know, these analysts and play-by-play -play guys say is not, it's not rocket science to you and me. It's, it's common stuff. I love the color that Kruk and others bring in when they talk about how you know, anecdotes where people, you know, players will bark at each other in this situation and sometimes they'll tip their hand doing this. Things that you and I could not have known because we didn't experience the game. But when it comes down to basic strategy and, and percentages and things like that, I think you and I are, are well enough versed in the game where we kind of know where a team is headed in terms of strategy and, and what kind of pitch they might throw and what kind of defensive alignment they might have, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, it's, 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 we're not quite Greg Maddox status, who once upon a time he told the pitching coach to go sit down because he's going to get the next guy to pop up foul to the first baseman, and he got the <laughs> next guy to pop up foul to the first baseman. But you watch enough baseball, you're going to pick up some things. Yeah, no, it's just, it's just repetition watching thousands of games over our lifetimes. Um, all right, so I didn't write any injuries down, but we kind of covered that who's injured right now in terms of Longoria and others. Um, well, Longo, I, the one thing I did see with Longo is he might get some minor league rehab games started during the All-Star break oh. so that he can maybe come back the week after. Uh, he started taking ground balls. Um, he stood in the batter's box for Bumgarner's side session uh, yesterday. And it was funny. Bum complained that it was his worst side session. And Longo's like, if that's your worst one, what do your good ones look like? <laughs> and, and apparently, you know, with modern technology, the thumb injury and everything fused and is healing correctly. So the fact that he's taking grounders in and of itself is, is a big deal. He's, he's been cleared for baseball activities. Oh, wow. Already. That's good to hear. Yeah. That's good to hear. It's still going to take a couple weeks. And, you know, just quickly, I, I want to touch on the fact that Pablo has been fantastic in his absence. But make no mistake, when Evan Longoria comes back, he is the starting third baseman. And sure. Pablo knows it, Bochi knows it, Longoria knows it. And the Giants have been missing him. The Giants are struggling against left-handed starters. Uh, going into yesterday's game, they were 18-19 and 19 versus left-handed starters, so now they're finally 19-19. and 19. But they have faced more left-handed pitchers than any other team at baseball. Mm -hmm. I looked it up earlier. They have 1,182 at-bats versus a left-handed pitcher. No team is even within 100 of them. Oh, wow. So the... Yeah, the NL West is absolutely loaded with – damn it, I clicked right. The NL West is absolutely loaded with these left-handed starters, so much so that the top five out of six teams on the list of most at-bats against a left-handed pitcher, not just starter, pitcher, they're all in the NL West. Like hmm. the Giants lead the way with 1182, and then you got – Come on. And then you've got the Rockies at 11.09. Then the Astros slip in there. And then it's Dodgers, Diamondbacks, Padres. Just to mm -hmm. contrast that, the Giants have 11.82 at-bats against the left-handed pitcher. The Milwaukee Brewers in the NL Central have 6.59. Oh, my God. Almost twice the amount. Right. And that is because of the left-handed heavy NL West. Yeah. And that's one of those hidden numbers that, that doesn't really get seen by the rest of baseball, and it shows how much the NL West is geared to beat each other in the NL West. Because you've you got teams like, I mean, it blows my mind that the Cubs have only 782 at bats against a left handed pitcher, mm -hmm. and the Giants, 1182. It's just, it, it was something that stuck out as I was doing research. So long ago, when he comes back, he's absolutely getting put right back into that lineup. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Uh, Longoria, you know, he's got 10 home runs on the team, which is third, but of course he's been missing the last four weeks. So I think he could have easily overtaken the team lead by now if he were healthy. So they miss his power. They need him. Um, and his defense has been okay this year. I don't think it's been stellar. I know he's a, he's a gold glover, but there's been a few games that have been, uh, you know, maybe not quite what we expected, but he is used to that turf in, in Tampa Bay, and maybe it's just been a – a few months of adjustment to the clay of, of AT&T Park along with other natural grass fields in the NL West. So, uh, But, yeah, they, they need him back. Pa Pablo's been very valuable filling in, and he's been extremely valuable off the bench. So that's 
kind of where his career is headed, and, and that's fine. I think that's a fine spot for him, and he has no complaints about it either. He's said it quite openly. He will do whatever he needs to do to help this team win. He acknowledged it after the walk-off hit the other day. Mm -hmm. That was stunning to me. You know, he still had the presence of mind to say, well, I still know my role on this team. I still know what they want from me. I still know that, you know, I, I'm not the starting third baseman. And it's just, it's impressive. The Giants have a really good clubhouse atmosphere right now. Yeah. It's good stuff. All right, well, coming up, the uh, Giants are going to close out the first half uh, with three versus the A's at at and Park. We mentioned before it's going to be bum. Shark and Suarez for those three. Then they're going to hit the all-star break in which Crawford will be the only giant there, which is really weird. Uh, we're used to, for the last five or six years, especially during the World Series years, uh, having you know five or so giants there. Uh, that's not the case this year. It'll just be Crawford because Posey <clears throat> bowed out and, of course, uh, Belt did not make the final vote. Um, and then they continue back up in the second half with three at Oakland to conclude the Bay Bridge series and then uh, two at Seattle and those are the the eight games are going to happen before we record next on July 26 in two weeks I myself am going to be uh, leading a research cruise offshore for about 11 days and so that's the main reason for the break in the recording I won't be able to podcast from a ship 50 miles offshore sorry people this is not going to happen uh, but I will be uh, most likely covering the game on Saturday night I put in my request for credentials, so uh, I will try, try, quote unquote, to grab some interviews before the game if I can make it off the ship uh, in time and walk down the Embarcadero and get there early enough. Um, but what do you got here? First time since Giants will face the same opponent six straight games? Oh, I didn't yeah. know this. Yeah, I, I dug that out out of the notes today. Since the Giants play the A's three, three times to end the break and three times times to start the second half and earlier this season when i wrote about circle these dates on your calendar i noted how weird that is yeah. you know to play the same team six straight times you know i looked through all the other team schedules and i couldn't find anything like this and it turns out it's the first time the giants will face the same opponent in six straight games since july 3rd to 6th of 1969 against the braves but four of those six games were part of two double headers so huh. it was really a four game series with a couple double headers mixed in to make it a six game series. They've never done something like they're doing three at home and then three on the road against the same opponent. And the only way for that to happen was because of the all-star break. We're mm -hmm. going to be so sick of the A's in, in the next week and so sick of this Bay Bridge series and the Bay Bridge new trophy. We're going to all be so sick of it by the end of. Yeah. Uh, you see the home and away series. Uh, well, I shouldn't say series, but games in, in, in the NBA where, you know, the, the Warriors will play the, the Kings, and then the Kings will play the Warriors, that kind of thing. So this is, I guess, unusual in Major League Baseball because they typically don't like to stack the same two teams up back-to-back -back because I think one of the theories behind the schedule makers, and I could be wrong, but one of my assumptions is you don't want two teams to play their entire season series consecutively because you want both teams to face each other at different times in the season. So you may face one team when they're hot and the same team when they're cold. If you come in and just sweep a team out of six games or you get swept in six games because you're you know, undergoing an injury or, or, or something happened to your team or you're just in a cold spell, I think it's a way of kind of normalizing the expected results of a season series between two teams. Otherwise, you, you could get some lopsided results if you, you know, for example, the Cubs, right, would play uh, eight games against them or six games against them if they do, you know, all six in a row. Uh, it could be a much different result uh, than if you were to split it up throughout the season uh, and you're going to face a different team too three months apart they're going to have a different roster makeup different starters uh different utility guys so i think that is usually the uh kind of the um the motivation for for doing that but i agree with you the the Bay Bridge trophy i tweeted that yesterday i was like okay so what happens if they split the series <laughs> i are they gonna get you know some mason to slice through it and split it up between everybody yeah, I mean, like, I could see if it, like, the trophy, I don't know if it's going to be like the Stanley Cup where it just resides, you know, with one team for a whole year. So I guess if you split in the subsequent years, that team keeps it or something. But, like, in year oh, number one, it's like, all right, hopefully they don't split it. <laughs> well, for the Giants' sake, we hope they don't split it anyways because we'd much prefer they go at least 4-2 and two or 5-1 and one over their next six games. Yeah, and, and let's be honest, the A's have won, what, 18 out of their last 23 they are yeah, one of the right. hottest teams in Major League Baseball. They have been pounding the shit out of the ball lately. So, uh, you know, let's not 
take these A's for granted. They got a better record than the Giants right now. They're in a much worse spot for the playoffs because their competition is further ahead than the Giants competition is. Uh, but by the same token, the A's, the lowest payroll in baseball, and they are outperforming the Giants this year so far in almost every way. So, uh, yeah, these guys have got to be shut down. You know, we're playing at home right before the break, take two out of three, and I think everyone's going to feel pretty good about going into the second half. Yeah, I don't have much past that. <laughs> All right, so that'll do it for episode 147 of the TortureCast. You can follow us, as always, on Twitter, at TortureCast. Like us on Facebook, where we post a lot of our stuff. And check us out on the web, on our website, at TortureCast.com, where we post all of our episodes there. You can follow us individually, at ChadK21 for myself, at 2 Out Hits for Eric. That's with the number two, and he's also been writing some excellent articles over at twoouthits.com, so I really urge you guys to go check that out, and I know that, what is it, a week away, a week and a half away, well, it was you're going to be launching your new endeavor? Be. Yeah, it was supposed to be, but some life stuff and some technical stuff has gotten in the way, so it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Uh, the heat has kind of melted my brain, and I'm not able to get certain things done that I wanted to get done ahead of time. So right. I'll, be honest, I'll be honest, dear listeners, I don't know when the hell it's going to launch. <laughs> well, sorry, sorry to throw you under the bus there. Eric. Oh, no, totally good. I plan on saying that. (laughs) Totally good. I I will fully admit when I put myself out there and then I don't follow through. (laughs) No problem. I, Hey, look, I've, I've tried to do a lot of things with this podcast. These great ideas I have, I'm like definitely implementing it in a couple of weeks and then it just doesn't happen. So life smacks you in the face. You got to work, you got to do stuff. It happens. Yeah. Life happens. And again, people, we do this for love of the game and of the giants. We don't do this we don't get paid. We don't even have a Patreon account or ad revenue or any of those kinds of things. We could pursue all that stuff. Um, but to be honest, uh, it is a, a niche audience, and we get we get a, you know lots of downloads, more than 1,000 per episode, and I've just been really thankful for the support from the Giants community. Uh, but again, we do this for the love, and uh, hopefully we can expand things into the future. Definitely thinking about having some interviews and some... Um, and not, I'm not just talking about players before and after the game, but I'm talking about, you know, beat writers and uh, blog personalities and people who just know the game uh, probably better than Eric and I. So uh, look for that uh, very soon. But until then, we'll record in two weeks on the 26th. Uh, we'll see you at episode 148 at that time. Until then, a boom. A big thank you to everybody for listening to the TortureCast, the podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. Follow us on Twitter at TortureCast. You can also like us on Facebook or check out our blog at TortureCast.com. I also want to say thank you to Ashcon and Bailey for letting us use their song Feeling Like a Giant for our intro. For Ben Lee and Chad King, my name is Willie Dills saying we'll see you next time.